everyone. Uh, I think we shall start now. Uh, it's already 3.05. And uh, my name is Manoj Sakya. Uh, I'm a PhD student, SASC, NTU uh, here in Singapore. And uh, uh, today we have invited uh, Mr. Hao Ning Wu uh, as a SLS talk. Uh, his title is How to Make an End-to-End -end Efficient Video Quality Assessment Possible. So he's a second-year PhD student, uh, as you can see in the post as well. And uh, he's supervised by Professor Weishi Lin. Um, and uh, he has been exploring, I mean, doing research that are related to video quality assessment. So today he will be talking about that assessment. He will be sharing with us about that assessment. Basically, SS, SLS Talk uh, is a platform where uh, all, all of us, I mean the researchers, we share whatever we do, whatever uh, we you know experiment with our work. So let me welcome Mr. Hao Ning Wu. Uh, Hao Ning Wu. Hello. Hello, hello. So hello. Uh, yeah. yeah. Jeff, now you can you can share the uh, share your slide and you can uh, start your presentation. So before, uh, but before you uh, you start your presentation, let me uh, share to the audience that uh, once the presentation is done, uh, at the end of the presentation, audience can put some questions or queries uh, to to our uh, presenter and. During the presentation, I request everyone to, to mute their uh, uh, microphone. And let me hand over the stage to Mr. Hao Ning Wu. Hao Ning, hi, let hi, me stop the share. Yeah. Yeah, 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 you can yeah. share the screen now and you can start the presentation uh, as well. Can screen? Uh, yeah, yeah, you can see yeah, that. So, so, okay. So thank, thank you, Mena. Thank you, everybody, for listening to this uh, SLS talk. So today I'm going to discuss about uh, uh, our new paper in European Conference of Computer Vision in 2022, which is uh, just accepted. Uh, and our name is to is that how to make an efficient end-to-end -end video quality assessment possible, right? Uh, and we do that through a sampling approach that is uh, specially designed for uh, video quality assessment. Now that I will share my slides and talk about this paper. So first, let me uh, introduce to you the problem, which is the in the wild video quality assessment. Uh, I like uh, previous studies on video quality assessment, which usually focus on videos after compression or after some specific algorithms so that the videos are with uh, very specific features or characteristic. So in the wild, we do call the assessment this difference. You see these three videos, they don't have some special features or characteristics. They're just very simple videos, but we need to assess the quality of them. You see, they are just very simple videos. Uh, and most of them are just directly shot by the cameras like your smartphones or cameras and and actually generated by users and uploaded to many of the uh, new uh, video platforms like YouTube, like TikTok, like many of these platforms. And, and it's eagerly needed to assess the quality of these videos to make good recommendation algorithms or to assess the, like, the ability of photographing of smartphones or cameras so that it's very important to do the video quality assessment on general videos, no matter where they come from. And, and our goal is to predict a quality score for these videos, or just uh, you may predict a score or you may need to compare the quality of this video. Like for this three video, you see that the downright video is with the worst quality, right? Everyone can agree with this, right? So, so our goal is to predict the quality scores of these videos, even, even though they are with diverse content and degradation. So we choose to use the deep neural network based method, right? Because deep neural networks can actually be content aware and be, have very rich features. But while using deep neural networks for video quality assessment, we meet a very 
a very, how to say, a big challenge or a dilemma for the real world video quality assessment. The dilemma is that how to deal with the large inputs, because right now you know that actually the videos are becoming with higher and higher resolution for like 720p or 1080p or in the full HD or in the ultra HD, the 4K. And with large sizes of the video, even you put them into a very simple deep neural network like ResNet 50, you need to consume very much computational cost and very much graphic memory, just as shown in the A of this figure one. You see that uh, with, with existing approaches or with ex existing paradigms, you need around 800 GB of memory. This is unacceptable for uh, deep learning, you know, because when you're training, you get A100, it's only 80, 80 GB of memory, right? So 800 GB is not acceptable for, for using, even with batch size four. So batch size one will be exceeding the uh, best A100 at present. So, so you cannot train this video quality assessment method. And another problem is that uh, when you are doing the inference, you need to consume very, very much floating point operations. Uh, like you see the gray line here with 1080p videos, you need to consume like 210 times of floating point operations compared with a very a 224 by 224 video. This is when we are writing the resolution of videos, the computational costs become unacceptable both for training and for inference. But another way is to, if we, if we don't want this high computational cost, we can also sample these videos or subsample these videos into smaller resolutions. This is very applicable, right? You, you can just resize this video like the red box shows in the B, or you can crop this video like the yellow uh, orange box show in B, right? You see these two, two things are just common ways in deep, deep learning to subsample or downsample videos. However, these two ways are just not appropriate for video quality assessment because you see reciting the, all these blurries, all these compression errors, the quality related issues are just corrupted during reciting. When, when after reciting, you cannot see, you cannot actually distinguish whether this is a good quality video or a bad quality video. And for cropping, actually you get a mismatched global quality. You may crop at a place with a worse quality than the global or crop may crop at a place with better quality than the global. So you cannot accurately assess the global quality. And these two ways both have their drawbacks. So actually for all existing deep, deep neural network based video quality assessment methods, they don't apply any sampling. And the way they try to use to avoid this high uh, training memory cost as shown in the 800 gigabits, to do this, they just pre-extract features from each frames. You know, they don't do a deep end-to-end -end deep learning. They just pre-extract features and store the features in the hard disk. And then they only train a two-layer two linear, like a two-layer linear network, so a very shallow network to regress these features, which is, you know, as most of this at present in 2022, most of the deep learning based methods are end to end. But for video quality assessment, I see all these more or most of these recent methods are not end to end, just due to the high computational cost of no sampling, but and the corruptions introduced by sampling. So that here they have dilemmas, so they cannot they have to choose a not that good way. That is not deep learning, end-to-end -end deep learning. For us, uh, we are just trying to solve this dilemma, right? So we have, uh, we have two goals. First, we would like to reduce the computational cost by sampling, right? The second goal is that after sampling, we would like the quality of the video is still preserved. So we design the fragments. The fragments are just uh, like his name. They are the fragments. Yes, they are composed of different mini patches. You can see see from the fourth uh, fourth column. 
just uh, yeah of this of this figure. You can see for this all this video one, video two, video three, video four. We actually just partition the video into grids and sample mini patches from these grids and then splice them together. You see, they all look like some uh, Lego. Just uh, you, you, you just cut them into grids and you sample small things from the grids and you splice them together. And you still can roughly understand what is happening in this video. And also you get a uniform quality representation of this video. So these are the basic proposal of our method is the fragments, which is very simple actually, uh, just a new sample that combines reciting, which is representative to the overall video and the cropping, which actually preserves the local textures like blurry, like the noises, which are important to the video quality. So here we propose the fragments, which are based on these patches, but we have a problem right now. Because the fragments are made up of this independent patches. So if we use a simple neural network like the ResNet50, we have some pooling layers or some other layers, which is not compatible with this kind of input. And if you can guess that we, we, we use a ResNet or use a convolution-based method, we'll need to have some convolution kernels just across these mini patches. And the worst thing came is that they, they may just misunderstand these this connections or discontinuities between these mini patches as quality defects. You see, if, if you get a, an original video like this, like the left one here, this one, this one is not a good quality video, but the prior knowledge we get is that these, these discontinuities are just artificially built by us so that we will not like the network to, to miss, how to say, to just misinterpret these discontinuities as quality defects. So we use the transformer-based network as WinT, you know, the swing transformers. And, and based on this, we also modify the attention mechanism, which is the based on windows, the window self-attention. And we also distinguish the positions of the pixels. If they are from different patches, we'll need to specially label the, the positions of them in the window-based self-attention in SwingT. And also we propose to use a patch independent uh, regression. Instead of regressing all the features from all these patches, we regress features from each patch independently because they are actually contain rather diverse information and, and actually the quality information should, can, can just be seen from only this patch and just we do not need to fuse them together and fusing them together will actually lose some information about quality. So here are the, the motivations of what we should do to, for the specific deep neural networks built for our proposed fragments. And so here is the second motivation. And based on this motivation, so we propose the fragments. Here is the full pipeline or the detailed pipeline of fragments. So first we will need to just uh, uh, cut the video frames into grids. You can see the red grids here, uh, just seven by seven grids, or you can just make it any, any, any granularity of grids for your want. And you sample a random patch from each grid. Why we can sample a random patch here is because that we have already cut into grids and the random patch in the different random patches in each grid should be similar. Yeah, you can see that actually they, they should be sample similar. So we sample the random patches, which are from the raw resolutions. We do not do any resizing or any processing on these patches. We only crop the patch from each grid and sample these patches here. So they are look like the red little boxes in, the, in here. And then to make sure we still understand the event or the, the semantics happened in this video or the contextual relation here. We, we, we use the term contextual relation because we are not sure whether the semantics can still be preserved. As you can see here, uh, the semantic is largely not preserved, but we still 
understand the basic scene information, the global scene information, and the and the background or the background and the the event, what is happening here from these all these frames fragments. So so to preserve these contextual relations, we use the patch splicing to just re-splice these little mini patches together into a large thing, an integrity thing like this in the right of this figure. So we see it, if you see it step by step, the first the first step is to partition this frame into different grids, right? You see that each grid is a part of this uh, a, a local region in this frame. So this is to better preserve the global quality because by cutting them into grids, we, we ensure that each local region, each local region in this frame is does have a representative for it. This means that you will not need to worry that with a random sampling, you don't sample the downright part which has the worst quality or the or the upright part which has a better quality. You, you have representations representative from all these all these different regions by this grid partition. So so th this is the way we, we use to preserve the global quality or to preserve the sampling uniformity. And the second is to just uh, sample these raw patches from the, the grids that is, which is very simple because we know we sample raw patches and so, so they are not corrupted, right? This is simple and we just use the sampling. We don't do any other operations, which is the simpler, the better. So we can, we let the deep neural network to do the processing on them. And the third way is, is a way which is not covered earlier is that the temporal alignment, which means that the patches sampled in different frames should be aligned. This is um, a relatively harder to understand just from these uh, steel figures, but we, I can show you a demo here. So you can see how these are temporally aligned. Yeah. As they are temporally aligned, these fragments are actually, com actually combined into sub videos in each patches. So you see each patch is, is actually becomes a video. And so you can actually understand the temporal quality of this video, which for this one, the temporal quality is pretty well. You can see without much variation with relatively smooth transitions. But for this one, okay, you can, you can spot the difference between these two, right? Because of the temporal alignment you actually can still sense these things as sub videos. So th this is very important because if we don't do this, we will not be able to distinguish the temporal quality. So this is for the temporal alignment. And after temporal alignment, it's the last step is to re-splice is all these patches, uh, which actually let us understand the thing, global thing information of this video. So here is the full sampling process of fragments, which can preserve the local and global quality and the temporal quality and the contextual relations in this video. So we can get a rough semantic information of this video. Uh, and this is a whole great mini pair sampling, the GMS sampling to get fragments. So after getting fragments, we, we just feed them into the proposed fragment attention network, which is actually based on the swing transformer with four layers. And the, the first three layers with window attention are actually modified by our proposed gated relative position biases, the B shown here. And the gated relative position biases are just for correcting the position uh, representations because, you know, the even, even the continuous pixels or the adjacent pixels may come from different mini patches. You see the green, red, yellow, and blue pixels here. They, they are actually come from different mini patches. And though they might be adjacent in the fragments, they are not adjacent in the original video. So we would like to use this GRPB to uh, distinguish between the actually adjacent pixel and uh, man-made adjacent pixels. So we have the different attention pair with different relative position biases to, uh, yeah, to distinguish them. 
And we also have this uh, intra-patch nonlinear regression, which is the patch independent regression that, that regress the quality of each mini patch independently, which have two, uh, two advantages. The first is that they can avoid uh, information loss for quality assessment. The second is that we can build local quality maps instead of the on top of the uh, whole quality score. We can actually get the quality, the quality score for each local region, which is uh, actually an important feature of our method we can see later in our visualization. So here, actually with the sampling of fragments and uh, fragment attention net for FA net, the two parts uh, composed of our full pipeline, the fragment sample transformer for VQA, which we abbreviate, abbreviate it as the fast VQA. And we can see later why we, we should name it as fast VQA because it's very fast. And yeah, so the input video is sampled while this grid mini patch sampling or called fragment sampling into these fragments. And then they come the input fragments to the FA net and after the FA, FA net, we get the output quality score. This is, um, yeah, we get this. And this is the full pipeline of our method. So here are the experiments to demonstrate the effectiveness of our method. And you see from the table two here is in the up, right, up left, we are much better, much more accurate in terms of SRCC and PLCC, here are two accuracy metrics in video quality assessment. Yeah, we are just uh, at most 10% better, especially in the 100, 1080p, the full HD videos. We are actually 10% better than the pretty previous state-of-the-art method, which is uh, very impressive. And, and you can also see from the table three that we only need very, very, little computational resources that we can run much faster than them in both CPUs and GPUs. And our flop is that very, very low, the fast VQA and fast VQA M, which is even more efficient. And they, they both reach state of the art and they, they get very good efficiency. And you can also see the performance flops curves on the right which is the, the flop is in, actually in log scale. So this means that we are actually reducing the flops in a very, uh, very impressive or very unprecedented way. So it's, so actually we, we, we name this thing as the fast weekly, which, which is an abbreviation, but, but we, it is truly fast. So yeah. And we, we also, because we are an end-to-end -end method, right? So, so if we train on VQA, we are able to update our backbone instead of only pre-extract features. If we like other methods, we pre-extract features. We will not be able to train this network or train this backbone. So, so actually, if we train this backbone, we can transfer the backbone into downstream tasks. Because video quality assessment does not have downstream tasks like video quality detection or video quality segmentation, we don't have such such downstream tasks. So we just uh, use uh, some neural downstream tasks. We we transfer them into other video quality assessment data sets, and they got very good results here. You can see the we we actually beat the existing state of art by a very large margin, especially for the uh, come with 1K and for the YouTube UGC data sets, we, we actually more than 5% better than existing state of the arts. And, you know, with much more, much higher efficiency. And the pre-training actually contributes a lot due to our end-to-end -end, end -end training made available, right? So we made end-to-end -end training here and we, we, we proved that the end-to-end -end training makes the backbone sensitive to video quality and can be transferred or can be fine-tuned to downstream or other data sets. Actually, these five data sets are representing very diverse uh, scenarios or situations because some for YouTube UGC, they are actually for some uh, gaming or some computer generated videos. And for CVD and live Qualcomm, they are actually for some simulated uh, distortions, but 
the quality of air or the quality sensitive features pre-treated by our end-to-end -end backbone actually can transfer well on all these cases. So this is very impressive because we just uh, uh, propose a new scheme which can, if other methods try to use our way, I believe they can also, perhaps in the future, they can also try to use similar ways to improve and which is beneficial, actually applicable to any methods. So yeah, we, we have also released the backbone with we trained for VQA. So if you are also working in this area, you can you can try to transfer this to your own data sets. And we also do some ablation studies for both the sampling approach and the network. So all these uh, proposed uh, parts get very good results and show effectiveness. And we can see, especially compared with reciting. On live WQC data set, we get very much improvements here. We got nearly 5% improvements on SRCC. So the live WQC data set is actually composed of videos in different resolutions from, from very low resolutions to very high resolutions. Using reciting is very harmful here. You can understand that if we have a full HD videos, video and we recite it to the same scale as a low resolution video, the quality between these two videos, the quality relations might be just changed during this reciting because the high resolution videos might originally have better quality than the low resolution, but after reciting it just adds low quality as the low resolution one. So, so actually this is extremely harmful on cross resolution scenarios, but fragments just can avoid this problem and can be especially better. And for, for other for other scenarios, it's also better and notably better, but not, not that good because uh, on cross-resolution scenarios, resizing is especially bad. So yeah. And we also have the qualitative study, which is which is uh, generating the spatial temporal local quality maps, which is actually enabled by our proposed um, patch independent regression head. And you can see that we, we, we can just, you, you see from the third column that the fragments here, yeah, from your eye, you, you may not be able to understand what, what it did for this event, but, but our network, our proposed fast weekly can be able to recognize that this is the main contents of this, this, uh, this video and be able to uh, predict that the quality here are better than the back plain backgrounds. And you can also see that from the, from the local textures, from the clearness, the first frame, the frame zero is actually much more clearer than the frame 12 and frame 20, 25, uh, which the, for frame 12 and frame 20, 24, there are much blurriness and they get much worse quality. And you can also see that from the original frame, which is actually recites, you cannot actually distinguish which frame is clearer, which frame is more blurry. But from fragments, you can easily see that the first one is the first frame is the most clear one. So actually, our score also shows that we are sensitive to such clearness and such blurriness. But these are cannot be signed, cannot be sensed by uh, reciting. So, And we are also able to reproject re the quality of mini patches into the original frames, and which is still kind of reasonable. You can see that from the places with the person here is with the highest quality, and with the blurry background is with the worst quality. So I think uh, this will be also very, uh, very useful. And yeah. So th these are all we would like to share today. And, and our conclusion is that our paper has shown that the proposed fragments are just effective samples for video quality assessment that better retain quality information, but they can also tackle the difficulties of high computing and memory requirements. You, you see the, if we don't sample, we'll have this, this difficulty. If we sample like traditional ways, we'll lose or we will corrupt the quality of the original video, but we use fragments so we can 
better solve on these two ways and solve this dilemma here. And we we come to state of the art in video quality assessment with much higher efficiency, much, much higher efficiency. And this is uh, very important as actually, as we know that uh, based on our knowledge, most deep learning based BQA methods are not taken into practical use due to their high computational cost. But uh, after the proposal of our method, after we, we released our weights here in the fast BQA, actually many companies are forking and start or starting our code and just transferring the things learning fast BQA into their own products because they can be used very fastly. So yeah, so I think this have actually be very useful and very beneficial to all people that would need a video quality assessment and need more accurate video quality assessment, but they have limited computational resources. So I think uh, this one is, yeah, this is a conclusion for this method. So, yeah, I, I think uh, for my sharing, it just, it just ends here, but I, I welcome you to discuss with me about any questions. Yep. Uh, thank you, uh, Haoning. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful presentation. And I think the work you have done and the, the application of this, this work is tremendous, I think. Uh, and I really like to congratulate you and then my best wishes. Uh, I have a couple of questions, but before I, I, I put my questions, I would like uh, all the participants to, you know, if they have any queries or if they want to discuss uh, on some points, they can, they can either write uh, in the chat box or they can directly unmute the mic and, and, and share the questions, queries. Uh, is there anyone who like to say the opinions or you know query? Let me. Uh, I think uh, there is no one, but um, yeah, uh, I let me go first. Um, Howning. Uh, like for example, the, in the in the first few slides, I think you started talking about the quality itself, uh, quality of the video itself, right? Uh, yeah. So, so I was, you know, the first time uh, when I saw the title itself, then I realized like, how do you define the quality? Because uh, in some ways, like, you know, some videos are, I mean, for some people they say like it is a good quality video, but for some other people they might say it's not a good quality video. Or something like that. So it differs in in, the, in in each and every person's perspective. And then we need to actually quantify the quality of the video. So how how actually you, you solve this one? Uh, uh, yeah, I know, I know. This is also a question actually everyone working in the video quality assessment will consider about that uh, for, for generating data sets, we actually mm -hmm. use the mean opinion of uh, many people just like for oh. To get the quality score for each video to collect the data set, we will need around 40 people to score on it and then get a mean score on this. But I think you say it's very, very, a very important problem that actually the mean opinion score can't, how say, can't represent all these cases. So I think the one of the our future works is to try to try to better uh, interpret. Uh, quality beyond the scores. But right now, I think the scores actually more represent the technical quality of the video. Like you can see on this, we have the scores here. So some score examples. This is uh, might be pretty clear. And these are generally for the technical quality, which is like for something that most people, people will agree. Like if it had noises or blurriness, or motion blurs or something like this, mm -hmm. it will be a bad quality video. And if it's very clear, if the color is very good, or these are for a good quality video. So I, I think actually right now people are just 
focusing still focusing on the technical quality so uh, which are not with so much diversity right now but i think in the future people will also move on to focus on more detailed or more fine-grained cases but right now i think like uh, i don't know if you can see this these are just the, the resized frames so so this one this video is for this one you can see this is the one so this one gets the worst score is just because the you can see the, the blurriness and the right, compression right. errors which everyone will agree it, it it's not a good quality video so mm -hmm. i think we are mostly focusing on things like that right now but in the future we may focus on more like we, we, we try to not only score it but explain it this is what i'm doing right now but it's right. it's not a published paper yet so Please, if, if anyone is interested, you can just uh, keep trending our future works. Right. Perhaps we may do it like in public in the next year. Yeah. Right, right. So, uh, Hao Ning, uh, and then um, I I realized that uh, you know the the solution to this uh, you know improving the quality uh, of the video, you started by by introducing uh, kind of fragments, right? That is the basis for your improvement, I guess, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, yeah. So, but, but, but then how, how you came to the point that, okay, the fragments probably can improve the quality. How did you realize, how did you get to that point actually? Oh, you mean how, how, how do I think about it? This yes, yeah, point? oh yeah. yeah. I, I think this actually is, uh, better discussing our extension paper, which we will be uh, we are submitting to the to the Tipami right now, but, and just we are still writing the draft. We we will just uh, put it into the archive oh. later. So mm -hmm. right, right now, I I can share you with some insights here. Just it, it is actually fragments. It's actually a combination of resizing and cropping. If you can see that, resizing is actually the best representative for the video's content, right? You can, you can actually uh, preserve all of the video's content based on resizing because it's totally uniform, you know, totally uniform. Um, but for cropping, it's the best way to preserve the local textures of this video. So, but they also have their own dropbacks because you, you have the representativeness, you don't have the, you don't have the local textures preserved. But if you have the local texture preserved, like cropping, you don't have the representativeness. So, so we are thinking about a, an interpolation way or an intermediate way between these two. That is both representative and sensitive to quality defects or sensitive to quality information. So, so we build these fragments here. So, and yeah. So I, I don't know if this is clear, but because it, it's very, uh it's kind of complicated right mm. but, but but actually we are just thinking about resizing can be viewed as cropping crop, cropping one by one pixel from a very small grid and the cropping is like cropping a very large patch from from a one by one grid but we are just do not do that so extremely we, we cut it into multiple grid and we also sample more than one pixel from each grid so that we can cover both textures and the global representative. So I yeah. don't know. Yeah, Honey, uh, but, but your, your technique will not actually improve the original, uh, the quality of the original video, right? Yeah, we, we don't improve the quality of video. We, we actually assess the quality. We, we, we try to retain the quality of the video. Try, try to let it still, uh, how to say? Uh, Even it, after resizing yeah. or cropping, we maintain the, the quality of the video, like like original one. Yeah, yeah. so so we are maintaining the original quality, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so th this, is, this is what we do, just to... So, so that means if the original video itself is not that good, uh, that means uh, the, the final product won't be that good also. Yeah, of course. Yeah, because because our our is to our method is to actually assess it and to distinguish which ones are worse, which ones are better, and 
For right. Osman or for other times, this is another end, right? We right. distinguish which are bad and so they can do something on this. But yeah, absolutely. for Hartman's, it, it's not for this task. I can say that. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's just for, uh, how to say, it? encoding, the, mm -hmm. not decoding, <laughs> encoding the quality of the video. Really, right. I yeah. absolutely yeah. agree. Yeah. Uh, Anik, thank you so much. Uh, I think. Uh, uh there is no question from the the participants audience uh maybe they can later communicate with you because we share uh, this video uh, if you don't have any problem right honing we share this video we are recording this video and we share this one in the youtube uh i think you don't have that problem i mean yeah i know that sharing I, the, uh, sharing the video to, to all my thoughts. friends yes, some okay, of my... okay. Yeah. Great, great. Thank you so much. And um, we will also share your, you know, GitHub and then uh, and then the paper that we have published, the link to the paper to all, um, you know, all the uh, all the students. So yeah. they Thanks. might, you know, they might get connect with you uh, later. But uh, before closing this one, uh, I would like to thank you uh, so much on behalf of uh, you know, SCSC, GSC, Graduate Students Club. And uh, yeah, Pascal uh, is saying something. Uh, okay, okay, great presentation. Okay, thanks, Pascal. Yeah, uh, on from uh, uh, the, from how, how Howning side. Uh, Howning, thank you so much. And if you have like, you know, another papers that you'd like to, like to present uh, among, I mean, with us, please uh, do not hesitate. And I also request all of you, all my you know friends out there, uh, please join us in this SLS talk and please do share whatever you do, uh, you know, interesting research you can share with us. And thanks a lot, everyone. And uh, let me close this session. Hounding, do you want to share anything uh, to the participants and and the, and the audience? Yeah, I think I think no right now. But uh, are you sharing these links to the YouTube, like the yes. project that page? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yes. So, so I think I think later I can I can just paste my extension paper link oh. into this, which okay. gives a better explanation of our motivation and right. propose an even improved method, a more efficient one, the faster we could. So, but we, it is not not finished right now. So, mm -hmm. like in one or two weeks, it will just. Be, okay. Be released. Yeah. Good. Good. Uh, Howning, thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining this session. And I'll see you in the next uh, SLS talk uh, episode 18. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Howning, thank you once again. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye, everyone.